Good morning. Um, our speaker today at Grand Rounds is Dr. Douglas Lee, who has been with us for the past four years, is an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics, and serves as the clinical director for the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology, associate director of the Cystic Fibrosis Center here, and the Home Mechanical Ventilation Program. After a BA in psychology at Northwestern, he earned a medical degree from Wake Forest uh, in North Carolina, and then completed his pediatric residency and fellowship in pulmonology at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, USC. He has, uh, his interests have included neuromuscular disease and cystic fibrosis, and he has authored four peer-reviewed papers, one book chapter, and an editorial. He's an active member of the California Thoracic Society Pediatrics Committee, and recently the American Thor Thoracic Society Clinical Problems and Pediatric Transitional Care Working Group. He has been named as the Southern California Super Doctor's Rising Star for the past three years. So the title of his talk is Respiratory Care of Neuromuscular Disease. Doug Lee. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. So what I'm talking about today is respiratory care of neuromuscular disease. Uh, as Dr. Vascar said, it's one of my interests and an emerging population in which I see a lot of changes uh, in the treatments in the, uh, recently. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So the topics I'm going to cover today first are the relationship between neuromuscular disease and respiratory disease. Then we're going to talk about each re uh, muscle group within the respiratory system and how each dysfunction uh, has an effect on the respiratory system. Lastly, how to identify and treat this dysfunction within the system. So what is neuromuscular disease? So it encompasses many, many diseases, uh, some common, such as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy. But for the purposes of this talk, I want you to expand your thinking and think of anyone with any sort of neuromuscular weakness, uh, such common diseases as cerebral palsy would fit under this. So just think very broadly for the purposes of this talk. So why is it important? So it has a pretty reasonable prevalence among pediatrics, but does account for a very large proportion of hospitalization. About 10% of neuromuscular, uh, uh, pediatric hospitalizations are due in some part to neuromuscular disease. Main reasons being major surgery and respiratory admissions. And the fact is a lot of these actually are recurrent admissions uh, due to one of those two reasons. So what's the normal course of neuromuscular disease? So it's a whole spectrum, like I said, but if you want to take a look at one disease in particular, it's spinal muscular atrophy. This is the most severe case and a case I'm going to highlight some outcomes later with. So typically with SMA1, you'll present with very uh, diffuse, very severe weakness initially. Uh, the main thing to note is that the main cause of morbidity and mortality is respiratory, uh, both with SMA and also with neuromuscular disease in general. And untreated, it has a very severe and very early mortality, unfortunately. So what is the cause of this respiratory disease? So this is how I like to think of things. The respiratory disease cascade in neuromuscular disease. So it starts all with an initial insult. And this initial insult is respiratory muscle weakness. Keep in mind here I'm not saying lung disease, because a lot of these patients do actually don't present initially with lung disease. It's really the supportive structures around the lung and not the lung itself that has the issue with neuromuscular disease. And untreated, unchecked, you'll end up with intermediate <coughs> pathologies. So these include impaired secretion clearance, recurrent atelectasis, recurrent infection, and aspiration. So these are kind of intermediate stepping stones that will eventually lead to certain clinical outcomes, a lot of which are irreversible. These include chronic respiratory failure, chronic lung disease, and restrictive lung disease. So you can see it starts with an initial insult and then multiple pathologies and immediately before you end up with actual lung disease in the end. So now I'm going to take a look at each respiratory group that's involved in the whole respiratory system. So there's many, many groups that are involved. and what you see as far as a respiratory pathology and outcome 
is directly related to the uh, muscle group that's affected. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to look at each muscle group as how it fits in the respiratory system and group it that way. So the major muscle groups I'm going to talk about are the bulbar muscles, the airway muscles, the diaphragm, intercostal muscles, abdominal muscles, and truncal muscles. So we're going to take a look at each muscle group, its actual function within the respiratory system, and what happens when you have its dysfunction. So the first muscle group I'm going to talk about is what I think of as the major muscles of breathing. So diaphragm, chest wall, and abdominal muscles. And within the muscles of breathing, it's important to have a second denotation with, from inspiratory and expiratory muscles. Talking first about expiratory muscles, those are needed specifically for coughing and active expiration. Typically, expiration is passive, so it's the recoil of the chest wall that causes uh, expiration during times of calm breathing. But if you're ill, increased work of breathing, or you need to cough, those are the times that you'll use these muscles. So what's necessary is that typically the abdominal muscles and the chest wall. So abdominal muscles will contract and create this uh, positive pressure, and the chest wall will also contract, uh, forcing the air out. So this is what creates the positive intrathoracic pressure within the chest. So without it, you'll have impaired secretion clearance and mucus plugging. This is a picture from a bronchoscopy which shows an airway which is full of mucus. And you can tell it's so plugged that this patient would probably need a procedure such as bronchoscopy to remove this mucus. So looking at inspiratory muscles, the main inspiratory muscle is the diaphragm. But keep in mind you also need the chest wall muscles to contract and, and also um, and, uh, stabilize the chest wall so that as the diaphragm contracts and you create the negative intrathoracic pressure, the chest wall doesn't sink in. So there's a few muscles that are necessary for inspiration. Without it, you'll have atelectasis and lung collapse. What you'll see on the right is a part of partial atelectasis of the right lung, and on the left, a full atelectasis. And keep in mind, this: I did separate inspiratory and expiratory muscles, but a lot of times you'll have uh, both muscle groups be affected, and you'll have both the mucus, mucus plugging and, and the atelectasis at, at the same time. The next muscle group we'll talk about is the truncal muscles. So these are the muscles necessary to maintain an erect spine, typically known as the erector spinae. And these are necessary to prevent scoliosis and restrictive lung disease. And this patient, the patient's young here, you can see the scoliosis is pretty mild, but a lot of patients with neuromuscular disease have progressive scoliosis that only worsens with time. And the restrictive lung disease comes along from the compression of one side of the lung. You can see uh, as, as the atelectasis worsens, or as the uh, scoliosis worsens. I referred back to the chest wall uh, with the inspiratory and expiratory muscles, but looking at them specifically, uh, they are their own group and they're fully necessary to stabilize the chest wall. And those are the external and the internal intercostal muscles. If you don't have a stable chest wall, you end up with two pathologies typically that you'll see with neuromuscular disease. These are pectus excavatum and the bell-shaped chest deformity. So the pectus excavatum you'll see on the left typically is a cosmetic disorder more uh, without actually causing much lung disease. However, in patients who it's very severe, it can cause an impact in the lung volumes. And that is caused by an imbalance in the forces. So if you have a stronger diaphragm than chest wall, as diaphragm contracts, you're going to create this negative intrathoracic pressure which will suck in the chest wall. Over time, it'll cave in the chest wall and also create this bell-shaped chest deformity on the right, which is a radiographic finding with neuromuscular disease where the ribs are actually pulled down. So uh, with the bell-shaped chest deformity specifically, it's more of a radiographic than an exam finding, but if you see this shape, then you should at least have some suspicion for neuromuscular disease. There have been very mild cases where the first suspicion of neuromuscular disease was uh, with an x-ray that was done for another purpose and showed this uh, abnormal chest shape. So keep in mind, both of those are due to an imbalance in the forces. Moving up, so we're going to look at the upper airway musculature. So the upper airway is stented open by uh, many, many different muscles. 
and those muscles uh, typically relax during sleep, and their tone is necessary to maintain patency. Without it, you are at risk typically for sleep disorder breathing, which for the purposes of this talk uh, will involve more obstructions and sleep hypoventilation or hypoxemia. There are some neuromuscular patients who also have some central apneas, but typically for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to talk about the obstructive processes. And whereas the prevalence in healthy children is about 5%, there are some studies that have quoted up to 10 times that prevalence in neuromuscular disease. So very, very, very prevalent. Related to the upper airway are the bulbar muscles, which are the muscles required for control of the oral contents. And without it and with, without good strength, without good coordination, you're at risk for pulmonary aspiration, another one of our intermediate pathologies. And not directly related, but still important to the respiratory system is the function of the GI tract, which the lower esophageal, lower esophageal sphincter, the uh, esophagus, anything that causes motility and prevents reflux. So if you have weakness of this, you're definitely at risk for reflux, which in turn puts you at risk for aspiration among disease. So to summarize the major muscle groups, so the bulbar muscles control the oral motor function, the airway muscles control the patency, the diaphragm is necessary for inspiration, intercostal muscles are necessary for chest wall stabilization, abdominal muscles for cough, truncal muscles for spinal alignment. And taken as a whole, this is, these are all of what's necessary to maintain the respiratory system. So now that we've defined exactly what the pathologies are, how do we prevent and treat this progression? So taking things back to our respiratory disease cascade, our goal is to both prevent the respiratory pathologies from happening and slow the eventual outcomes of uh, actual lung disease. So to treat this, I'm going to draw on American Thoracic Society statement. So this is our national society, and they have very clear clinical guidelines on how to treat certain diseases, such as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. I chose Duchenne's because it has the most clear guidelines out of the whole group uh, that are evidence-based and do have clinical uh, expert consensus on. So what I'd like to do is look at these guidelines and expand them to see how we can uh, use it to treat other diseases who don't necessarily have these very clear clinical guidelines. So they identify three pillars of treating neuromuscular disease, or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy in particular. <clears throat> so that's surveillance, airways clearance, and respiratory support. So taking surveillance first, I'm going to give you a window into what we do. So as specialists, the ATS uh, describes when specialist care should be initiated. So they say to avoid a crisis model of care, the committee recommended an early age or pre-symptomatic consultation with a specialist and regular screening with respiratory function. So the main thing to draw from this is that the earlier we see them, typically the better. And they go on to describe a few details as to how often and how involved we should be in the care of these children. So they recommend twice annual visits with the specialist. And I think the details are not necessarily as important as the concept is, uh, that they're pre presenting here. So when they're no longer ambulatory, so when a patient's weak. So if you notice a patient's weak, they should probably see us. When the force valve capacity is 80% predicted or less, so when they start to have an impairment in lung function, or after the age of 12 years. So this is really dependent on each disease process. When do you think they should start actually having problems? So those are the three things generally to try to keep in mind when, when uh, deciding when to refer. So what are some of the tools that we, we as pulmonologists and everyone here has to screen these patients? First thing to remember is what are we screening for? So these are the intermittent respiratory pathologies I referred to earlier. Impaired secretion clearance, recurrent atelectasis, recurrent infection, and aspiration. And we have a number of tools as a group to screen these patients on a regular basis. And I'm going to talk about these each. So we have pulse oximetry, capnography or blood gases, pulmonary function testing, overnight polysomnography, chest radiography, 
modified variant swallows, and gastric emptying studies. Within our clinic, to give you an idea of what we do for these patients, is we typically see them a little more often uh, than, than the ATS had initially recommended. So we like to see them typically quarterly unless they're asymptomatic. So during these quarterly visits, we'll test their, along with the whole MD visit, we'll test their oxygenation, their ventilation, and do pulmonary function testing. Annually, we'll do polysomnography and chest radiography. And as needed, we'll refer for the GI studies. And we do try to approach things from a multidisciplinary view here with uh, involving respiratory therapy, social work, and a dietitian also in our clinic, as well as the M MD and RN. But going back to our tools, the first thing I want to talk about is pulse oximetry. So all, all very familiar with this. Only thing I'd like to say major about this is that if you don't have a fully normal saturation, 95% or above, there might be a sign that something's going on. So if you have a patient that's somewhat asymptomatic but only has a saturation when they're well of 91, 92%, that can be a sign there's mu mucus plugging, atelectasis, uh, something that you need to screen a little more deeply for. So just to accept anything above 90%, we should shoot for probably 95% or above to, to, to really say, you know, are these patients clear of any uh, respiratory disease. As pulmonologists, we also look at ventilation as well as oxygenation. So measuring the CO2 can be done in a few ways. The most non-invasive and easy way to do it, if you have capability, is the end tidal, end tidal CO2, which we have in clinic. We can measure it by, via the trach, uh, via nasal cannula. It takes 10, 15 seconds, and we can trend it. Um, and that's a reasonable screen. If you, if you get a good end exhalation sample, that it should be a pretty good uh, sample of the uh, alveolar gas. So we don't typically do blood gases regularly unless we think it's indicated, but we do screen them regularly for problems with ventilation. One of the cruxes of our screening is pulmonary function testing. And keep in mind, this is something that anyone can order. There's a pulmonary function lab as well as we do this by Ron Pierre in our clinic. But there's a pretty big uh, difference in what's actually done. And, and those are one of the things I'm going to outline here. So a, pulf, a full pulmonary function test is one that you order from the lab. And this includes the lung volumes, the spirometry, the maximum inspiratory, maximum expiratory pressure, and the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide. So this is a full test. You order in Care Connect, you'll get it done through the lab, and you'll get the results uh, directly. Uh, we do a portion of this in our clinic at every visit, uh, as long as the kids are of age. And that's just the, that's the spirometry. Those are the force maneuvers that we're familiar with. So what might you see with a full pulmonary function testing? So there's a few things. So if you're looking at the lung volumes, the first thing you'll see is restrictive lung disease. And this is defined as a total lung capacity less than 80% predicted. Think of these as small lungs. So lungs are either small because they're compressed or because th there's some developmental issue with the child. So typically with neuromuscular disease, it's more of a compression issue. And you'll also see a hyper hyperinflation, which is defined as residual volume greater than 120% predicted, which is a sign basically that the air can't be fully exhaled from the lung. So this is typically important because what you want to do is risk stratify these patients. So the patients that have restrictive lung disease are at higher risk for having issues with anesthesia, uh, with prolonged extubation. They'll have more issues with current infection. So these are the patients that you need to keep an eye on a little more closely if, if you notice that their lungs themselves are small. Looking specifically at spirometry, so this is the test we do to check for asthma, for obstruction, as well as uh, issues with the vital capacity. So typically, they will have an issue with a diminished force vital capacity, which I think of as a usable portion of the lung. But they typically don't have obstructive disease unless they have asthma or some issue on top of that. Um, and that's why you might see a decreased FEV1 because small lungs will give you small flows no matter what. But if you correct for the size of the lungs, that typically you won't see obstruction unless there's some other disease on top of that. So another source that we look at is the respiratory muscle strength. So we look at the maximum inspiratory and maximum expiratory pressure. So this is important because 
This will give us a sign of how strong the respiratory muscles are and the ability to cough. The actual best test to see if you can clear your uh, secretions is a peak cough flow or cough peak flow, but we don't do that here. So the closest thing you can get is a maximum ex expiratory pressure where you're basically blowing out as hard as you can. And this will give you a, a somewhat indirect sense of how well they're able to cough out and clear their secretions. So another test that we do is overnight polysomnography, which if children are gonna develop hypoxemia or hypoventilation, they're likely gonna develop it first during sleep due to the fact that that's when their respiratory muscles are the most relaxed. Uh, a lot of the muscles are paralyzed, especially during REM sleep, and their uh, control from the brain is not as strong. So if you're gonna develop hypoxemia, you'll first probably develop it during sleep. So uh, that's why we focus specifically on uh, sleep for these patients. So the overnight sleep study here, uh, it can be ordered by anyone. If you have questions about the types to order, you can always ask us. But it does require parents to come overnight, sleep with their child. But also, um, none of the tests, none, none of what they do is invasive. There's just a lot of uh, leads that are placed on them and a lot of sensors, but nothing that's invasive, something I always tell parents. And we typically obtain these annually unless there's an actual problem. And we do have a new sleep specialist here, Dr. Iqbal Rashid, for those who haven't met him. And he sees, uh, he's reading all of our sleep studies now. The chest x-ray itself is a very good screening tool because there's a lot of different pathologies that you might see specifically on, on the x-ray. So scoliosis, atelectasis, mucus plugging. You can look at the chest shape or volume or look for the development of chronic infiltrates, which can be a sign of chronic lung disease. So for instance, you'll have some atelectasis in the upper right-hand corner. You'll have this bell-shaped chest deformity in the bottom right, and a small lung volume here with some chronic, likely chronic infiltrates in the lower left. So this is a sign that there is actually some respiratory pathology happening. So moving on from surveillance, I'm gonna talk about the next two pillars of the respiratory care of neuromuscular disease. So those are airways clearance and support for breathing. So what are our goals for the respiratory treatments? First, we want to partially replace the loss intrinsic function. And I say partially because none of what we do is as good as what the body could do on its own. So uh, the, the best we get to try to do is support things and partially replace it. Uh, try to mitigate the loss of lung function, a process that will probably happen slowly over time anyway. Uh, minimize the risk of pulmonary infection and maximize their quality of life. Looking specifically first at airways clearance, who's a good candidate for airways clearance? And this is a question I get a lot, whether it's from parents or the house staff, who would benefit from these treatments? And there are a variety of subjective and objective measures that I use personally. The first thing I like to do is just ask the parent, how is the child's cough? Is the mucus getting stuck in their chest and their throat? Is it happening when they're worse when they're ill? Um, a lot of times this itself is, is a pretty good indication uh, that, that they need some extra help with airways clearance, especially the sensation that, the, the, that they um, aren't able to fully expel it and the mucus is just right at the back of their throat. So first, a simple question. Uh, but then other more objective signs, recurrent atelectasis, recurrent infections. If a patient's just not doing well, you, you need to uh, think about adding something, some therapy to their uh, regimen. And the most objective measure is the uh, maximum extra maximum expiratory pressure on their pulmonary function test. So if this is diminished, then they'll likely need uh, some extra help given that their uh, cough flows are probably low. But a lot of times we're not dealing with this, such as patients are too weak to even create a force, then we'll be relying on the first three instead of just the um, maximum expiratory pressure. But um, if, you do, if you are able to get pulmonary function testing, that's one important thing to look at for them. So what are the various airways clearance techniques that we can order inpatient and outpatient for our children? So I've listed four here. I wrote reviews for three of these as physician papers for the California Thoracic Society from which I'm um, basing some of this data on. But the general thing to note is there's actually not a whole lot of evidence to, um, for, for all these therapies, uh, usually smaller studies, but um, that's changing over time and we're starting to uh, use emerging therapies.
But the four therapies are albuterol manual chest PT, which is our most basic therapy, uh, mechanical insufflation, exufflation, otherwise known as cough assist, high frequency chest compression, and intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. So looking at the mechanical insufflation, exufflation, here's an example of one device. There's many types of devices. Here's just one, just so you are familiar with what it looks like. So what it does is cycle positive and negative pressure. So there's insufflation and exflation. And what this does is simulate a cough. And theoretically what it does is bring the mucus from the large, from the large airways out. And the data to support this is pretty strong. Uh, and it is pretty standard of care for anyone with neuromuscular disease. And it does, has been shown to improve uh, long-term gas exchange and maintain long-term vital capacity. Some practical aspects of it. So it can be administered via the face mask, via the mouthpiece, or tracheostomy. It's not uncomfortable, but it's not completely comfortable, but it's a fairly well-tolerated uh, therapy, something I've tried myself, and it's it just feels a little strange, but it's not doesn't cause pain typically. Uh, what we'll prescribe typically is five cycles twice a day and more when they're ill. And what you do is set an insufflation and exhalation pressure. So the blowing and sucking pressure. Anywhere from 20 to 40 is, is usually the range that we shoot for. So if you're a little less than that and the patient's inpatient, unless they're really young, they probably aren't getting enough pressure. So I'd shoot for typically at least a pressure of 20. And uh, if you want to know what it feels like, you can either put, hold your hand up to the mask as the therapy is going, or you can try it yourself. But it's, um, like I said, not a fully uncomfortable uh, therapy. It can be used inpatient and outpatient. So high frequency chest compression. There's many different types of devices, like I said, for, is, are similar to uh, cough assist. And this is just one of them. Uh, we're a lot of times more familiar with this with the uh, cystic fibrosis population, but there is data that shows that it can help other populations outside of that. So it's the vibrating vest that we're familiar with in the hospital typically. And what it does is create this differential air velocities which shear the mucus off of the wall. And theoretically, whereas the cough cyst will move, air, uh, move mucus from the large airways out, this will move mucus from the small airways to the large airways. So mechanistically, they work a little differently. And evidence supports a reduction in hospitalization rates. And once I get into these next couple of therapies, including this, th these therapies are, are, are quite expensive, so it's important to keep in mind. Uh, not every patient qualifies for them, and this is where we look specifically at what the data shows. So if a patient's having uh, re recurrent hospitalizations, then they might benefit from this therapy. So that's the way I think about it because a unit is about uh, $15,000 here. So typically it's used for children aged two and up to, because the vibration we don't want to cause for, for young children uh, issues within their brain. But it can be used a little bit younger than two. The normal cycle is 20 minutes a few times a day and more when they're ill. And what you do is set up pressure and frequency. It really depends on the type of uh, chest vest that you use, but there's different uh, frequencies and pressures that are recommended based on the age. So that's something that the respiratory therapist can help you out with, especially if you're ordering an inpatient. Uh, another therapy we're going to talk about is intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. So there's two examples of it here. And this probably has more utility, at least uh, initially, inpatient than outpatient, but we are seeing more outpatient usage of this. So this is a device that uses high frequency oscillation to basically uh, use pulsatile gas to blow the mucus off of the walls. And evidence does support decreased antibiotic usage and treatment of atelectasis. And personally, I've used this for patients as outpatient who have had recurrent atelectasis with pretty good effect. Uh, and that's chronically, but also it can be used uh, on an inpatient level uh, for acute atelectasis. Some practical considerations. So it, it can be administered via a mask, a mouthpiece, the tracheostomy, or in line with mechanical ventilation. So this is a good advantage for patients who are chronically event dependent who are unable to come off the vent at all. Uh, it's also typically provided with a respiratory treatment. 
So you can give a few things at the same time here. And you set a rate and a driving pressure with this. And once again, the, the respiratory therapists are the, the most experienced at uh, actually setting these for us. At UCLA, the MetaNeb is a system uh, that, that we use quite commonly. So this involves the IPV, the one I just mentioned, but also adds another therapy, the positive expiratory pressure. I'm mentioning it only for the purpose of this talk because, you know, because a lot of us are familiar with it here, but um, the positive expiratory pressure itself doesn't have a whole lot of data in pediatrics, especially outpatient, but uh, the therapy we have here is a combination therapy, the IPV plus the positive expiratory pressure, which will uh, give intermittent pulsatile gas as well as lung inflation. So that's what's available in patient. One thing that's important to note is that these things, these airways clearance techniques work differently, and sometimes the patient's on more than one, and the order of the treatments is quite important, inpatient and outpatient. So mechanistically, what you want to first do is bring the mucus from the small airways to the large airways, and then move it out after that. So that would involve IPV and or HFCC vest first, followed by insufflation, exufflation. Occasionally, they'll need some oral suctioning in the end, but that's how you move the mucus from the deep airways step-by-step uh, step out. So changing gears, we're going to move from airways clearance to respiratory support, which is the last pillar of, air, uh, last pillar of the ATS. So our goals are to increase gas exchange, prevent or treat respiratory failure, improve sleep quality, enhance the functional status of patients, and prolong their survival. In order of escalating therapies, the four that we typically use are oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, which is our newest, most emerging group, uh, the tracheostomy, and then tracheostomy with mechanical ventilation. So oxygen is our most basic therapy. We can provide it via the nasal cannula, uh, among other things, and the indication is day or nighttime hypoxemia. So simple hypoxemia, we can treat them with oxygen itself. If we want to evaluate them during wakefulness, we'll just get a pulse ox when they're awake in clinic, versus if we need a, uh, if we need a test during sleep, we'll go straight for the overnight, overnight uh, polysomnogram. If that doesn't solve things, or if there's hypoxemia as well as hypoventilation, then we need to go straight for non-invasive ventilation. So this is the BiPAP or CPAP. And it's a positive pressure delivered via mask many different types of masks available. It can have an improvement in the chest wall deformity, or it can cause an improvement long-term in the chest wall deformity in some of these patients, and it might have some benefit in long-term lung function. Uh, the way it can be used, so typically we like to use it only overnight, but it can be used around the clock if you're using it for comfort care. And the first time that people might uh, be exposed to this is post-operatively, so thinking back to lung function and risk stratification, so say a patient has a diminished uh, vital capacity or a diminished lung capacity, uh, if we're sending them to surgery, we might suggest that they be extubated to BiPAP afterwards to assist uh, uh, with their transition to normal breathing. So some practical points about this. So typically we use nasal masks only in these patients. So secondary to the fact that they're weak to start with. So if they have emesis and they need to take off the mask, a lot of times they're unable to or they're too weak to. So we'll, we'll use a nasal mask to decrease the risk of aspiration, especially if they have an a, a emesis event. Initial patient size changes with time. Uh, as we start to use more and more, we're using it on smaller patients. So this uh, is a uh, moving target. Uh, when we use settings, we'll typically use it more for uh, fully ventilating a patient versus with CPAP, we'll just be stenting open the upper airway. This is something we use to almost replace a ventilator and breathe for the patient. So uh, that means setting with a backup rate as well as uh, higher pressures to be able to fully ventilate the patient. Long-term risks of using this are aspiration. We try to mitigate that. Mid-face hypoplasia is the one problem that causes that gives people hesitation and using this in very young patients is that eventually over time just the pressure from the mask and the developing face will cause a, 
a, a hypoplasia in the area. So that's probably the one thing that's holding people back in that uh, area. So if hypoxemia or hypoventilation are not fully treated with the non-invasive ventilation, we'll need to move the tracheostomy. Some patients will eventually move here event, uh, anyway. And this gives us a stable airway for routine and emergency situations. And one important thing I like to tell parents is it does allow still for amb ambulation, and it might or might not be permanent depending on their disease condition. And lastly, if the tracheostomy itself does not fully solve things, then we'll need to add the home ventilator. In that case, this is uh, hypoxemia or hypoventilation un, uh, unreleased fully by tracheostomy. Does still allow for ambulation, although they are uh, needing to bring the ventilator around with them. And this is an example of one of the mini ventilators we use in this hospital. So to review, so this is the respiratory disease cascade, starting with an initial insult, ending up with intermediate respiratory pathologies, and ending with clinical outcomes. So we have all these therapies, all this surveillance. How do we actually make a difference with these patients? So this is a study done in, in the Journal of Neurology in 2007, which shows a Kaplan-Meier curve. And there's two groups of patients here. So first, there's a solid line, which is patients born 1980 to 1994. So think of these as the patients who are treated with uh, techniques from an earlier era versus those with a dashed line, which is 1995 to 2006. So this is the more recent patients. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of survival along the y-axis and age along the x-axis. So I'd like to take age 50 months as an example. So with age 50 months, the cumulative survival was 25 to 30 percent versus age 50 months now is 65 to 70 percent. So all these therapies do make a difference. And what is actually making the most difference? So when you look at the differences in the, well, how the populations were treated, <clears throat> there were three significant differences that they found. The first was ventilation for more than 16 hours a day. So that speaks to the third pillar of, respiratory, uh, of uh, the ATS in neuromuscular disease, which is respiratory support. Usage of mechanical insufflation, exufflation, which is second pillar, airways clearance, and the gastrostomy tube for feeding, presumably because they're finding aspiration. So to summarize, the major source of morbidity and mortality in neuromuscular disease is respiratory. Early initial screening and regular screening is very important for these patients, as well as aggressive respiratory support and airways clearance. So here's my references. And for those that don't know our division, uh, we've added a few people recently, and we'll meet you soon if we haven't yet. And our, we're, we're available in our clinic with, uh, these days, about a one to two day wait, uh, even for new patients to, to accommodate. So you can refer as, as needed. So, so, oh yeah. So, so, so the question was, uh, with the various airways clearance techniques, is there a risk for barotrauma and pneumothorax? So th there is always the theoretical risk for, for some versus the others. Um, anything that, pos that, that gives you a positive pressure and expansion, such as IPV and metaneb, will probably put you more at risk. I haven't necessarily seen that as a problem. But if you, if you would think about it with certain types of patients, those with severe lung disease and those requiring high pressures, those are the patients that you probably would have a little bit of increased risk for. Um, but typically, we haven't had any problems on, 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 on a uh, long-term basis. Yeah. 
So let me think. So the question was, uh, what, what is our home vent population here? So if we're including patients with non-invasive ventilation, we're probably somewhere 80 to 100. Uh, if we're talking about just home ventilators, uh, probably on the order of 40 to 50 is, is, is my uh, general sense of things. So, so the question was, uh, for patients with spasticity, what, what are the appropriate airways clearance? I think that's a great question because that, that, that's really the, the big question everyone's asking because that's the biggest group we have, you know, bigger than Duchenne's, bigger than SMA is, you know, this huge, huge population of patients. Um, and that's where I, I think of, you know, we have to fall back on what the evidence shows. So number one, for those patients, uh, the cough assist, I think, is the first one, especially if you're eliciting the history of... Uh, of, of the mucus being stuck in their throat. Um, I mention that because, you know, it's pretty widely available. Uh, it's a therapy that can be done without, w w with, that's very quick to do. Um, it's not very, very expensive. Uh, I'd start with that. And if you have recurrent hospitalizations, you can think of other things. So recurrent hospitalizations, you think more of the vest. If you're having recurrent atelectasis, then we think about adding uh, IPV or another therapy like that. So um, basic therapy, I'd say cough assist, and if there's other specific indications, then, then we can add on the other, uh, the more es escalated therapies. But that's, that's a great question, because otherwise, you know, we don't necessarily want to prescribe every single therapy for every patient. It'd be too much of a burden for our, for our system. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so the question was, for patients with skeletal, dis skeletal dysplasia, is there anything we can do to delay tracking them uh, besides using the BiPAP masks? So r really, there's not a whole lot as far as respiratory support, unfortunately. Um, really, the, the, the bridge or the intermediate therapy that we're trying to use more is the uh, BiPAP or CPAP, which um, unfortunately does require a pretty tight fit of the mask if you're actually going to use it in, in a safe manner. So those patients, th there is not a whole lot, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, uh, so, so, so the comment is, um, you know, Dr. Weiss has uh, experienced about 10,000 10, children to meet this criteria. That, that, that sounds about right, um, that it's a, a, kind of a soft criteria and that anyone with, so for purposes of this talk, anyone with any muscle weakness can fit into this. So, you know, it depends how narrowly you want to define it. But uh, with, for those who are uh, likely clinically affected, it's probably at least that. I, I would uh, I would agree with that. Oh, and um, uh, and, and Sharam, I think you know one one thing, um, one uh, therapy comes to mind. I think that you know that that uh, that was used before that might fit into that a little bit, and that's negative pressure ventilation, which we don't necessarily. Uh, I, I don't actually have much experience since it hasn't been around. Uh, we've used other therapies. We, we use positive pressure, but for negative therapy, negative pressure therapy for those. You know, it's the old iron lung with uh, polio, which I've read about. But, um, but uh, that, that's one therapy where um, 
it's one possibility. You know, you can avoid the tracheostomy, uh, but if you are using negative pressure to ventilate them with the chest, you're, you're likely also causing some upper air pressure. So you're going to suck closed in any upper airway obstruction. So if they're at risk for uh, sleep apnea already, then then you're only increased scent risk. But that's one therapy. So I don't know if it'll eventually catch on again, but um, it, it just came to mind as we were thinking about that. Definitely. So, um, co cognitive outcomes for children with uh, on-home ventilation. So, we know hypoxemia is not good for the brain. Hypoventilation, uh, similarly, and for a lot of these kids, for very young children, especially with SMA. Uh, they're probably, before we're actually starting ventilation, going through periods of intermittent low saturations and hypoxemia that just happen um, before it's clinically relevant or relevant, or before we're able to actually uh, get a sleep study on them. So if we're looking at, uh, you know, I'm going to extrapolate from uh, congenital, sep congenital central hypoventilation, which is another syndrome where you have definite low saturations. So for those patients, the earlier you can get them on stable respiratory support, treat their hypoxemia, the better. Uh, we know that the ones that present later typically have more cognitive dis dysfunction and issues, structural brain issues, secondary likely to the, the, the low saturation. So I can imagine it's the same for, same for this population. So um, the longer you're gonna go with untreated hypoxemia and hypoventilation, the higher risk you are for cognitive defect. And, and I would say the only real way to screen for that is a, a sleep study. So we don't even rely on our own. Um, so history of snoring, history of obstructions is not necessarily enough. Uh, and there's no survey necessarily that's going to really key you in on this. So if, if we think a patient's really at risk for, uh, for hypoxemia, then, then going for the gold standard is, is really the only way to go from our perspective. Yeah, so, um, so, so Dr. Kelly mentioned, you know, from the ICU's perspective that uh, given the high cost and the uh, inability to obtain all the therapies uh, for different patients, especially in, in uh, remote areas, that we'll, we'll try to be mindful of that and, and, uh, as, as we order their therapies. And, uh, you know, I think to speak to that, part of what my goal was when I wrote the uh, the position papers for the, for the CTS was to try to standardize when some of these uh, therapies are necessary because CCS and Medi-Cal and, and, and uh, other insurance companies will not necessarily be, so there's so little data that it's easy for them to, to deny therapies. But if there's a position paper that say, at least in this case, in these special cases, it's necessary that, that, that it should be, get, should be written for. Um, and I think, you know, referring to those, those papers, I think, should be helpful. And it's something that C C CCS had asked of us to try to clarify when these therapies are actually necessary. Definitely. And, and, and his follow-up comment uh, was related to um, the importance of advocacy uh, in decreasing overall cost, uh, secondary to getting these kids out of the hospital and getting them home and, and keeping them out of the hospital. I, I agree completely. Yes, from this article I read news, they said that it's been about 10 years as it took for them to get to phase three. So for, uh, so, the, so the comment was, or the question was, for kids who are born with small lungs for various reasons, how long does it take for them to outgrow that uh, outgrow that situation um, probably depends on on what you're dealing with to start with uh, but 
a lot of times, specifically say with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, with, within one to two years is typically when they're able to wean from oxygen. Um, we know the lung has a pretty fantastic uh, ability to grow and repair itself and alveolarize. And the longer, the more studies are done, the, the longer we're seeing that uh, situation happening. So you get the most alveolar growth in utero uh, in the first year or two of life, and maybe a little bit more even after that. Um, so given that, you know, that it's a pretty steep trajectory that um, usually they grow out fairly quickly within, within one to two years as long as it's not a uh, disorder where their chest wall itself is, is not growing. Couple questions? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.